Nine of the Democratic presidential candidates are planning to participate in a town hall focusing on LGBTQ issues. Gender equality, of course, is a major priority for many of the candidates and has been a somewhat controversial issue under the Trump administration. In her new book, For the Love of Men, A New Vision for Mindful Masculinity, journalist and author Liz Plank explores gender roles in our society and the inequality that still exists. And Liz joins me now to discuss the book and why she decided to write it. Great to see you, lady. Great to Congrats. see you, too. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so why did, why now for this? Yeah. Can I just tell you a quick story? I remember back, uh, maybe 2011, I was mm. in a Fox News green room with Rick Santorum. Okay. And I was telling him about a project I was working on to help more women to get into politics. Wow. And he said, well, I'm worried about the men. And my reaction was like, what? Yeah. Like, it kind of grossed me out, honestly. Mm -hmm. But there's a good reason to be worried about the men. Yeah, I think that when we hear people talking about men and men's issues, it's often, unfortunately, I think people like Tucker Carlson, uh, people like uh, Jordan Peterson, and maybe even Rick Santorum. I don't know what his argument was at the time. <laughs> um, but there's this, this idea that, you know, there's a war against men, and it's uh, the fault of feminism. It's the fault of, right, you're paying too much attention to what, what's happening to women. Men uh, are suffering because of this. Men are suffering because of feminism. Men actually thrive under feminism, right? So I actually went to Iceland, the most feminist country in the world, for this book, and I went to save men because I had heard that feminism was so bad for them. They did not want to be saved. They like their <laughs> they parental leave. Okay. They like the welfare policies that come from gender equality. And so um, I, I really wanted to dispel this myth, right, that gender equality um, hurts men or that gender equality is not something that men benefit from. Men actually have benefited in a number of ways that I you know, talk about in, in, in the book uh, about the, these conversations around gender equality, but I think that feminism needs to do a better uh, job of really including men in the conversations that we have so that we have a gender-neutral feminist movement that is unabashedly interested in everyone's well-being. Yeah. So what do you make of the rise at this moment of like a Jordan Peterson yeah. and the version of masculinity that he sort of espouses mm -hmm. and subscribes yeah. to? After interviewing several men, I've been working on this book for four years. Um, and doing a lot of research and data, I'm not surprised by Jordan Peterson. I'm not surprised that there are just thousands and thousands of particularly long, young men, young white men, who are lining up to see his shows, who are lining up buying tickets that are up to $250 just to meet Jordan Peterson. Wow. Um, Jordan Peterson is the most, uh, the m biggest best-selling Canadian author, more than Malcolm Gladwell, more than uh, Margaret Atwood. These are significant numbers, and there's a vacuum. There's really a lack of conversation around masculinity to our original point that we were talking about when it is talked about it is uh, owned in this um, I think negative way in these unhealthy ideals of masculinity Jordan Peterson tells men that they have to toughen up he tells them uh, he doesn't believe that trans people exist uh, he doesn't believe that trans people have a right to have uh, their pronouns used um, you can research and, and, and look at all of this if we don't have a positive conversation around masculinity where progressives and feminists acknowledge that it can can be hard to grow up as a man in a society where the definition of masculinity and the definition of manhood has changed a lot and that we don't have a space for those conversations, then those young men, unfortunately, are going to go to these sites, they're going to go to the alt-right, they're going to go to, to Jordan Pearson in order to feel seen and yeah. to feel heard. And many of them are also voting for Donald Trump because Donald Trump is saying a lot of things. But what he's saying when he's speaking is, I, I, I hear you and I see you, even though you're a, a white man and that's become a slur in our society, I understand your pain and I'm going to solve it. If he's actually solving it, that's another conversation. Right. But um, the first thing is to feel like someone doesn't have contempt for yes, you. Yes, exactly. And that you matter. Right. It's so interesting because this is something that, um, that I think is one of the fundamental underlying dynamics of the Trump era is this sort of like searching for what masculinity, this crisis of masculinity yeah. in the modern era. And I've also felt like we don't really have the language to talk about it. We have mm -hmm. some of the language to talk about um, racism and racial yeah. bias and implicit bias. Like we have some of mm -hmm. that language fleshed out, but I'm not sure that we really have had the architecture and the framework to talk about what's going on with yeah, men. Yeah, yeah. And what you just said is so important, right? We, in the conversation around racial justice, we've acknowledged that there are um, acts of conscious bias, so many, right? And people who are racist and want to be racist and are doing it on purpose. There's also unconscious bias, right? These ways that people might have a good intention, but they're 
actions are not in line with those intentions. Yeah, which because frankly, of, all of us fall into in certain us, ways, right? but exactly. as hard as we may try otherwise. Yes, so Renee uh, Myers, who's a, an amazing woman who ta has given several TED Talks, she's the head of diversity at Netflix now, she says, if you have a brain, you have bias. And so we're starting to recognize and, and, and create, again, a space where people can be forgiven and people can be educated and where they can come in and, and make mistakes. And we need to have that same kind of space when we have conversations around gender where we recognize that this is a post-Me Too era, that there is a, a plan for men like Harvey Weinstein, and it's called prison. Uh, but what's the plan for men like Joe Biden? What's the plan for men who might want to adapt to new norms and new rules but are failing uh, in their sort of journey? Um, and, and, and how can we help them rather than just shame them? Right. Um, and, and I'm not saying, you know, anyone can feel the way that they want to about Joe Biden, but we need to have a, a space where we um, create a path to redemption, yeah. uh, where we, we, we have empathy for how difficult it can be for a lot of norms to be changing in our society and not assume the worst in men, but assume the best in men. Cancellation can't be the only answer. No. There has call to be in feminism, not call out feminism. Like, I don't want to be judged yes. by that stuff. Absolutely. You know, because we're all going to screw yes. up at some point. Yes. And that's not to say that there aren't people who do deserve mm -hmm. to be basically out of play yes. society, Absolutely. who don't deserve to have that talk show, who don't deserve mm -hmm. to have that Supreme Court justice seat. Yeah. But there has to be an answer other than just cancellation. Mm -hmm. What has the response been from other feminists? Have you received pushback for a focus, an explicit focus on men? I have, uh, and I understand where that's coming from because I had the same sort of pr 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 proclivities, really. I had the same, uh, I think, behavior when I would see people talk about men and say, what about men? I would respond, well, everything's about men. Why do we have to talk about men? And again, through the reporting and the research and the conversations that I've had with, with men and women, I've realized that that, that that was not right. And actually, that was pushing away people that we really need to be part of our movement and who are being served by our movement. And, you know, I say this all the time. I think Trump is throwing a way better party than us for men, right? He is making <laughs> it fun and celebratory. And you can come in, whatever you say, whatever you do. We don't care. We don't care. Fine. We see you. And we... Our policies are better, and by our, I mean progressive policies, yeah. are better for for men. Um, they, you know, when we talk about Medicare, when we talk about gun safety, there's a suicide epidemic in this country, and the vast majority of people who are dying from it are men. So I visited uh, the state of, of Montana, where, you know, there's really, really skyrocketing suicide rates there. It's the second highest rate of suicide after Wyoming, and 80% of the people who die from suicide are men. Yeah. And there's a direct correlation with if a gun is available and accessible, you are far more likely to act on impulse and then to, to die from suicide, even though women are more likely to actually attempt suicide because men have access to these more violent means. It really it just is, is killing men. And that's just one little part of this. We, we have to talk about how our policies benefit women, benefit people of color. They also benefit white men. Yeah. I think there's a class piece as well yes. because it's easy to look at you know wealthy, successful white men and think that that's everyone. But there's mm -hmm. also a lot of class bias in this country that goes unnoticed and I think mm. plays into some of these dynamics as well. Absolutely. And you've always talked about class. Class is so incredibly important in all of these conversations. And it really reminds me of, you know, the patriarchy is a pyramid scheme, right? That the patriarchy benefits uh, and, and rewards a man, certain men, right? This 1% right. actually of men. It's, it really is a class conversation about this, this, this hierarchy. We often talk about the hierarchy where, you know, we assume men are on top, white people are on top and women, people of color, trans people, non-gender non, uh, binary people, but there's also a hierarchy just within men. And that's the male code. That's the thing that is kind of like Fight Club when I would talk to men, that being a man, the number one rule was that you didn't talk about it, hmm. that you didn't acknowledge the way that, yes, there's violence and there's policing of men towards women. There's also a lot of that from man to man. Yeah. And a lot of men are not, are being told that they're going to be rewarded when they act in a certain way that's aggressive, that's, you know, all of the sort of hyper masculine ways that we assume in our society. But the men who really benefit from that are white, straight, cis, rich, right? Donald Trump became president. What happened to Sean Spicer? Right. Um, and, you know, Sean Spicer is still probably in that 1%, but he ended up on Dancing with the Stars, Being right? Being humiliated on Dancing I with mean, the Stars. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I think that's the trick of Donald Trump. I think that's the trick of a lot of people throughout the history of this country is getting essentially poor white people, poor yes. white men yeah. to support the agenda yeah. of their race or their gender yeah. rather than yeah. sort of sticking with their um, their class. Right. Because if that if that happened, then they would be unstoppable. Um, the book is great. It's Thank important. You. Thank you so You know, much. I love you and I'm so proud of you. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Liz. Thanks.
We'll have more rising after this.